Um, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, uh, and a warm welcome to all, wherever you are. Thank you all for joining us for this inaugural webinar session organized by the IWA's newest specialist group, Sustainable Coastal and Estuarine Development. My name is uh, Siva Sivakumar. I am an associate professor in civil and environmental engineering at the University of Wollongong, New South Wales, Australia. I'm also the inaugural chair of this specialist group. Uh, the agenda for today is that uh, after my welcome message, uh, we'll do a poll uh, the, and our moderator, Professor Fangian, uh, will go through the, the housekeeping uh, uh, and introduce the speakers. We have two well-renowned speakers uh, um, and uh, followed by Q&A, and I'll come back uh, to close the seminar. Uh, some of you may be aware that we are, the, uh, we are previously the International Association for Coastal Reservoir Research for the last six years and has now become the IWA Specialist Group on Sustainable Coastal and Estuarine Development. And this happened in March this year. Uh, there are over 32 mega cities in the world which have a population more than 10 uh, million, and 70% of them are in the coastal areas serving a population of over 400 million people. So this type of large-scale urbanization has significant impact on coastal ecosystems, at the same time, they also require sufficient amount of clean water, energy, and other waterfront and other infrastructures. So our specialist group aim is to uh, contribute to the, solving these issues associated with sustainable coastal nesturian development. In this regard, we are running a, a, an international conference, maybe in the next slide. Uh, so this uh, international conference is going to take place in uh, uh, Changchao, uh, at uh, Ho Hai University between the 6th to the 9th of November, where uh, we will have 14 world-renowned keynote speakers, 10 invited lectures, one uh, full-day interactive workshop, uh, followed by a, a technical tour of world largest coastal reservoir situated in the Yangtze estuary in Shanghai. So uh, I hope uh, some of you will be able to join this conference uh, although the abstract deadline has passed, uh, 15th of September, uh, if someone really want to send an abstract, certainly uh, you certainly can contact the, the organizers. So with that uh, introduction, I'll pass it on to our moderator, Professor Fang Yen, um, to, to start the, the webinar proceedings. Thank you, Fang Yen. Yeah. Uh... Hello, everyone. Can you hear me? Yes, uh, I hope all of you are well and staying safe. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and also good evening to our esteemed uh, speakers and all the participants from wherever you are. Uh, welcome to the IWA. Okay. Uh, uh, IWA uh, Special Goods uh, uh, webinars for today. And uh, before we proceed, uh, we have some uh, uh, webinar information that I would like to inform you. Uh, this webinar will be recorded and this will be made available on demand for the IWA Connect Plus and uh, with present presentation slides as well as uh, on other information. And the speaker are responsive for the securing uh, copyright permissions. And uh, for any of the works, they will present of which they are not the legal copyright holders. Uh, the opinions from the, yeah, will be hypothesis, conclusions, uh, conclusion, and also the recommendation contained in the presentation and other materials are the sole responsibility of the speakers and do not necessarily uh, reflect any of the IWA opinions here. Next. So, uh, I would like to invite uh, all the participants. Uh, later on, you can uh, ask the questions. You can either uh, use the chat box, uh, you can use to, to provide your general requests or any of the interactive uh, uh, activities, or you can ask questions to our, but our speakers later. Uh, please use these uh, buttons on your right-hand side to send any of the questions to our panelists, as well as to our speakers. Uh, we will 
try our best to answer all your questions later on at the end of the uh, sections. Next. So this is our moderators and also the speakers. I would like to introduce to you our Associate Professor Mutu Kumara Maru Sivakuba from University of Wollongong where he also just to speak with us uh, a few minutes ago. And myself, uh, Fang Yen Tiu from University of Nottingham, Malaysia. I will, one of the, I will be one of the moderators for today. Uh, and also we have Emeritus uh, Professor Arthur Minit for the Technology University of Delft, Netherlands. As well as we have uh, Dr. Afi 3 Rama for UNESCO France. Next. Next. So before we start our programs, uh, let me uh, introduce our, our, our speakers here for the first speakers. And but before that, I also like to introduce that this IWA uh, webinar series is one of the best platform for us to share uh, knowledge and also experience to ensure successful implementations of the sustainable uh, assuring and also the coastal developments. And uh, we would like to see uh, more participants to join us, uh, especially on the questions and answers sections later on. And uh, today webinars, we are going to listen to a very interesting uh, technical topics from our speakers here, Professor Arthur, a minute. And uh, I will read out the, his uh, uh, CV, where uh, it's a very long CV. Professor Arthur Minutes is a Emeritus Professor of Hydraulic Engineering and Environmental Hydroinformatics at the IHE Delft Institute of uh, Water Education and Delft University of Technology. He received his Master of Science degree in Civil Engineering from Delft University back in 1976, which is quite a long time ago, and a science degree in Hydrodynamics of, and Coastal Engineering from Massachusetts Institute of Technology in 1980s. He was employed at Delft Hydraulics and also as well as uh, IHE Delft uh, since quite some time, uh, more than 30 years. And he worked in various field of river, coastal and offshore engineering and became directors of strategic research and development at Delft University at, in uh, 1995. At Delft, IHE Delft, he served as a professor of environmental hydroinformatics in 1997, as well as the chair professor of the hydraulic engineering and river basin development groups in 2010. He, as well as uh, he's also the help, head, head of the water science and engineering developments from 2011 to 2015. He holds numbers of the international appointment and awards, including visiting professor at the Rowa Institute of Hydraulic Research as well as an adjunct professor at the Chinese Academy of Science, visiting professor at Sichuan, Sichuan University in Chengdu, honorary professor at the Nanjing Hydraulic Research Institute, China. Professor Menet was the chair of the local organizing committee of the 36th IAHR World Congress held in 2015 in Delft, the Hat, in the Hat Netherlands. He's also the IAHR lifetime members 2016 and honorary members 2019, as well as the member of IWA Special Group on Sustainable Coastal and Assuring Developments. Without further ado, I would like to invite our Professor Menet to deliver his speech and also his uh, lectures for today. Thank you very much, uh, Fang Yen. What I would like to share with the audience uh, today in the next uh, 20 minutes or so uh, are some experiences from the Netherlands and the development notably from let's say grey infrastructure to nature-based solutions to achieve a sustainable coastal and estuarine development. So I would like to let's see if I have the control there we go. I would like to recall that uh, if we look at the extent of natural disasters as reported in the literature, we see that it's been growing very rapidly, and this is only to the uh, beginning of this millennium. But if you follow the news, Libya, for example, you can see that there's a, a rapid increase in 
in disasters and the worst is yet to come, I'm afraid. Also, if we look at the damages uh, of floods, just to have one component, we can see that it's been worldwide, widespread death tolls, even up to the tens or hundreds of thousands. And in terms of economic loss and damages, it's uh, really billions of whatever currency you prefer. So there's a great need to remedy that or to secure that we have, uh, that we are positioned to deal with that. Because if in terms of GDP, if we look at the impact of coastal floods, for example, it could be between say 4% or 10% of the uh, G GDP, which is substantial and may affect uh, economies for uh, decades, if not more. Just to share with you some recent coastal floods uh, as they happened. As you can see there, they're to a large extent in the east coast of the US, but also in Asia and uh, to some extent also in uh, Europe. Um, so these are uh, considerable numbers, vast uh, areas that are affected for a long period of time which means that we have to find ways to secure coastal protection, uh, living conditions, water supply, in short, to secure global water security. See. If we look at protection levels, uh, there may be a few things to note. On this picture in the upper left, upper corner, say it's, uh, the economy and the protection level for New York. Now you may notice that then uh, on the horizontal action uh, axis, there is a protection level of one in 100 years. And the potential loss uh, up on the vertical axis is considerable as we have seen in the recent past. If on the other hand, we take uh, the city of Rotterdam, you see that the protection level in the Netherlands there is uh, a hundredfold, one in 10,000, moving up to one in 100,000 for some parts of the Netherlands, um, because the major part is below sea level and we cannot afford having any economic losses or recovering from that. Just to focus, and, and as I mentioned, my objective is to share with you some lessons learned from the Netherlands. Uh, so that in other deltas you could, um, you know, make use of that. You can see in the right figure that the Dutch delta is uh, largely three rivers, maybe four, uh, the Rhine Meuse estuary coming from Switzerland, Germany, France, notably. So it's at the end of the river stretch, and you can see in the left picture the country of the Netherlands, where the blues indicate it's below sea level. So the deepest location in the Netherlands is even 6.7 meters below sea level, which is where the water will go if dikes fail, as you can imagine. The flood prone areas is notably in the West, which is the economic uh, area of the Netherlands. Uh, and it's about 10 million people that live in that area. Um, some parts are protected, uh, other parts are very flood prone. And it's a considerable, say, uh, differences in, in the levels of the land levels as we have here. It's not only it's that it always was like that, it's not, but I will not elaborate too much on that, but you should realize that if you develop coastal reservoirs or polders, the land is likely to subside, notably if it's a peaty soil. If it's sandy soil, it may stay, but peaty soil. So in the four centuries that the Netherlands has been developed and developing polder, notably in the West, 
some of these boulders over 400 years have been uh, lowering the, uh, the ground level for four meters. So roughly a meter per century, uh, four meters below what it was in the past. And that goes on in other parts of the world as well. Let's say Jakarta, for example, if you pump groundwater, you will pump yourself to the bottom. So it's not necessarily uh, the Netherlands, but it's notable. And here you can see uh, some impression if there were no water management in the Netherlands. This is what the western part would look like. And you can see Delft in the lower corner uh, to the left. Uh, it, part of it may be above uh, sea level, but the other parts may be flooded. Schiphol Airport, for those of you who have traveled through there, uh, would be completely underwater because it's five meters below sea level. So my main point here is uh, water management and flood protection is a must in the Netherlands, not a luxury or something we occasionally do. If you don't do it, there's no Netherlands. It's that uh, simple. So that's why we have to, and uh, that's being done. If you look at the major floods over the past century, say, you can see various coastal floods in various parts, depending on wind direction uh, over the several centuries. Major ones you can see here, this one in 1916, near the Amsterdam area, that uh, triggered the, the Dutch government to create a large closure dam up, uh, say, in the northern part. By that time that that was achieved, uh, the next say, disaster came in the southwest western Delta, 1953, uh, which caused major casualties and uh, a lot of problems. So, so at that time, the Dutch government said, well, we have to do something uh, in order to sustain because we cannot remedy or repair after coastal floods. And, the Dutch Delta design that was set up there was to secure, say, flood protection. Because you can see with and without flood protection, the coastline of the Netherlands would have been vastly different. You probably are aware, if not, it's easy to Google, but there are major uh, hydraulic structures in place in the Netherlands to secure fl uh, to a flood uh, risk, say. And, and uh, uh, the reason for me to point out this one on the Eastern Scheldt is that in some essence, say, it's the, one of the first structures that allows for environmental issues. Uh, originally, it was designed to be closed off the estuary completely, but um, because of economic constraints and fisheries notably, uh, it became a semi-open storm surge barrier, uh, which indeed tripled the cost of the uh, structure, but also they resulted in considerable engineering experience on how to deal and how to develop, say, uh, solutions that take into account the environment and the sustainable development, uh, rather than a rigid change in uh, regime. There's another one near Rotterdam, and this is a picture uh, every year it's being tested. These are in essence to floating Eiffel Towers. There's twice as much steel in each of the barriers uh, than in the Eiffel Tower. And they float out and they can close off the Rotter and protect the Rotterdam Harbor. And now these of course are major engineering works and uh, what the Netherlands are famous for, but it's not the motto of my presentation. My Motto is that uh, perspectives are changing on coastal reservoirs and delta development. Right? So just to have some highlights. Now there's more attention and awareness on uh, reintroducing tides and having a more natural regi regime 
in order to secure water quality rather than water quantity, because flood protection is one, but water supply and uh, living conditions, agriculture are equally important. So there is a considerable trend towards working with nature, building with nature rather than opposing it. Uh, that means that nowadays the estuary in the southwest of the Netherlands is reconsidered and works are going on to um, say remedy the disadvantages of permanent closures in order to have more attractable, uh, attractive live, uh, living conditions and to secure water quality, as I mentioned before. So uh, to share with you a long tradition in the Netherlands of focusing on flood risk management, stringent safety standards, predict and control the regime, but the emerging paradigm is to go towards integrated and adaptive approach uh, in governance terms. Uh, water governance, a very important component in uh, the water sector nowadays. It's been referred to by Bill Clinton, I believe, as the polder model, which means a lot of stakeholders getting together to agree on future development. If we look at the Dutch Delta, uh, this is a sketch, say, of uh, a sandy coast and the sandy protection levels, but a PT uh, hinterland, you can see that we are subject to sea level rise, decreased river discharges, salinity intrusion, land subsidence, uh, more intense rainfall as we experience almost everywhere in the world, increased river discharge, increased erosion, and more pressure on spatial and economic development. How to deal with that in a small country like the Netherlands at the end of the rhine meuse system? That's a question that a Dutch committee, Delta committee has been addressing. And in essence, the question is, should we leave or should we stay? And at what cost? I would say that this is uh, also in the Netherlands, a new trend of thinking. Uh, it's not post disaster, uh, say remedy uh, the effects, but anticipating future changes and uh, anticipating scenarios and say looking uh, at the sustainability of the coastal and estuarine the uh, area in the Netherlands, which is the motto of the uh, IWA specialist group. Living with water, working with water was the uh, working the title of the report by this committee. And it looked at various parts of the Netherlands and had a longer term perspective, half a century, a whole century, the end of next century. What can we expect in case of sea level rise? One meter we can deal with five meters may be difficult, 10 meters, we have to change urban planning and change the uh, country's uh, topography, if you like. So recreating the estuary towards a more natural, more nature-based uh, way is uh, ongoing as we speak. Uh, it's not urgent, but it's necessary to anticipate. The same is with the sustainability of the coastal reservoirs in the center part in the Netherlands, near Lake Eisel, uh, how much water can be stored there uh, for a dry periods, which is definitely one of the effects that we are experiencing uh, also some part of this summer, but certainly last summer. How to secure water supply uh, in case of droughts is uh, really being investigated uh, in great detail by uh, Dutch research institutes and uh, uh, government agencies. So flood control, I would say from hard closures to more open structures, land reclamation, not necessarily only for agriculture, but also for urbanization and nature development. Coastal reservoirs, uh, reintroduction of islands for bird life and natural development. These are all ongoing things and the same on priorities and operating rules to allow for saltwater intrusion, having brackish areas is some uh, development that is presently taking place. Uh, 
for fish population for uh, say safeguarding the natural uh, environment. You can see here this picture you said that living with water uh, requires spatial new spatial concept uh, or new concepts in spatial planning you know it, it, it's not trying to push it out but trying to live with the water and make use of the water also for storage. Without going into much detail uh, my take-home message here would be uh, you have to adapt and not manage in a master plan for the next thousand years or so. That's not a wise thing to do and not the right thing to do. But you have to identify pathways and tipping points and uh, logical uh, developments that could take place, avoid overinvestment and combine with other agendas like uh, redoing uh, cities or, or, or urban maintenance and so if we take um, river discharge as an example if we know that the peak flows will increase we have to identify what is a threshold what is a tipping point and then work backwards from there to see uh, how long does it take to remedy or to take measures and this is decades rather than uh, weeks for example and then at some point, decisions have to be taken in the Netherlands called Delta decisions. They're taken by the um, House of Commons, uh, by the government, uh, investing in certain measures depending on the priorities. So these are all ways to not wait for the disaster to come, but anticipating and taking measures. In, in terms of economic values, you could say that rather than having large investments, for uh, in a linear way for a long time, we would prefer the, uh, to tailor the investments towards what is really needed and then taking into account no regrets that need to be done. Uh, and that way it's economically feasible as well. Th this, by the way, is a trend that we see in flood research in the Euro European Union on a wide basis moving towards adaptive management, not uh, master planning rigidly, but adaptive and taking into account some flexibility. And I would like to end with uh, quoting Professor Huub Savernay, who uh, had a uh, keynote presentation in the Coastal Reservoirs uh, Conference some time ago, where he said, well, it's important if you do any designs in coastal reservoirs to introduce flexibility on, in the design because design considerations may change uh, in future and you would like to be flexible to adapt to these changing conditions. So to paraphrase Hubert's uh, message, my message would be work towards nature-based solutions for sustainable coastal and estuarine development and that from Yen is pretty much my last slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for Professor Maynard. Yeah, I think uh, this is a quite an interesting uh, uh, lectures and also uh, talk that can really deliver to us. And we can see that uh, you have uh, tell us how can we work towards the nature-based solutions, especially for the sustainable coastal and estuary developments. And uh, I can see that uh, we combine with your 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 guide uh, guides just now together with the Professor Hubert's. Uh, we are definitely, especially for the all the engineers, we should be more flexibility in terms of doing design based on the nature based solutions. Without, we are going to for the second uh, speaker. Uh, thank you very much. Again, we are thank you very much to Professor Arthur Minutes. And uh, we have the next speakers, which is uh, Professor Rama F3. Okay, let me read out uh, her CV here. We have uh, Dr. Rama F3, and she is from UNESCO. And Dr. Rama F3 is currently a chief of sections for capacity development and water family coordinations in the Division of Water Science Intergovernmental Hydrological Program, IHP, UNESCO HQ in Paris. 
So she, she is uh, responsible for eco hydrology, water quality, and water education related activities for Goberi. And she was previously the deputy regional coordinator at the Global Water Partnership Southeast Asia, GWP Southeast Asia, based in Jakarta, Indonesia. Prior to that, she worked for more than 15 years at the Institute of Environment and Development uh, under the National University of Malaysia as a visiting professor, as well as uh, have an extensive research and academic experience, especially in the field of integrated water resources. Sustainable ecosystem management, sustainability uh, science, as, as well as watershed and community-based uh, water management and multi-state water engagement at various levels. So without further ado, I would like to invite Dr. Rama Afitri to deliver to us his her uh, topics on eco-hydrology implementation for the sustainable estuary and coastal water in terms of the UNESCO aspect. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much, uh, Dr. Teo. Um, it is a privilege to me, uh, uh, for me to be here today with all of you and to share uh, some work related to eco-hydrology implementation, uh, focus uh, especially for sustainable estuaries and coastal water towards uh, achieving water security, which is in line with uh, the UNESCO ISP 9, which is the current phase of ISP 2022 until 2029. So uh, my name is Rahma El Fitri. Um, I'm currently a chief of section for capacity development and water family coordination within the Division of Water Sciences, uh, UNESCO ISP, and also in just for a specific program on ecohydrology. Um, so to give you a little bit overview about UNESCO ISP, uh, some of you know uh, about uh, this uh, UNESCO intergovernmental <coughs> hydrological programs. Uh, which actually stuck since uh, 1975, uh, the, the ISP 1. And then you can see the evolution um, for the ISP 2, 3, and now we are at the ISP 9, uh, um, which uh, the team focus on the science for water security in the changing environment. As we talk about uh, ecohydrology today, um, ecohydrology is also have its evolution uh, within the ISP phases, and we start our eco-hydrology uh, approach uh, since uh, 1996, uh, which is uh, during the ISP 5, um, and then uh, the, the evolutions uh, of the ISP itself uh, from, uh, from um, I mean, it, from starting uh, focusing eco-hydrological processes in small basins, and then um, uh, focus uh, also after that the integrative science uh, to solve issues surrounding water environment and people. And uh, again, uh, for during the ISP7, uh, another focus uh, of uh, ecohydrology, um, mostly on sustainability, which uh, launching the ecohydrological demonstration uh, project at the time in various countries also. And then uh, for the uh, next, uh, ISP-8 will focus on the integrative science from molecular to basin scale. And at, at this stage also, we do the revitalization of ecohydrology program. And now, uh, during the ISP-9, uh, we focus specifically on ecohydrology for water security, which is in line with the ISP-9 um, team. Uh, and also, we want to promote the implementation of ecohydrology in the designated sites where UNESCO have the various uh, designated sites such as Biosphere Reserve, a World Heritage Site, and also Global Geopark. So this is among our focus uh, during the ISP 9s. And specifically during uh, ISP 9 also, we have uh, five uh, priority areas. If you can see here in the middle, focus on water governance, uh, water education, uh, scientific research and innovation, bringing data and knowledge gap also on IWRM. And also plus uh, another three additional cross-sectoral group, which uh, uh, focus on uh, I mean cross-sectoral with these all five priority areas, uh, um, focus on hydrological system, river climate risk and water food energy nexus, also on groundwater and human settlement. And last but not least, we focus on the eco-hydrology and water quality. 
So this is where ecohydrology uh, play important role even in this ISP 9, which uh, we want to implement ecohydrology approach uh, in uh, uh, the catchment scales in various catchment area in in all countries or member states uh, to get a benefit uh, for implementing nature-based solution approach to which, uh, through the specific approach we call ecohydrology. So what is a uh, UNESCO ecohydrology approach? So we uh, established uh, this uh, ecohydrology approach uh, since 1996, as you uh, shown in the evolution of ecohydrology. Uh, because uh, this is due to the urgent need to accelerate the implementation of water-related uh, SDG. So we need to use the ecosystem properties as innovative management tools, which is, which is also a nature-based solution approach. So by using this uh, nature-based solution approach, uh, uh, we will address the, the uh, issues related to water management, um, including how to improve water quantity and water quality by reducing the pressure or impact uh, to ecosystem at all scales. So we promote uh, uh, our, our approach uh, to do this uh, through a dual regulation, regulation, which is uh, water and biota interplay, uh, which also can be translated uh, into nature-based solution uh, approach. And on how we work to do this or to promote this uh, approach, uh, through our uh, UNESCO water family and also the Mossad network uh, towards achieving these water security uh, challenges. So what is our UNESCO water family? As we, want, we, um, um, we work with our various member states, so ISP also have uh, about uh, 172 ISP national committees. I think you know maybe one of, you are also part of this one national committee from uh, any kind, from specific countries. And we have also around uh, 70 water-related chairs uh, and unit team network, which also supporting us in implementing our work uh, for uh, related to water and also for ecology. Also uh, another 17 ISP flagship initiative and the secretariat, which is uh, our, us here in ISP secretariat. Also uh, our various regional hydrologists and science officer in field office of UNESCO and another 30 water specialist center or category two center, which ISE is, uh, DEF is one of our water specialist center of category two listed. And uh, also World Water Assessment Program, which is part of our UNESCO water family. And specifically on ecohydrology, we also have our sort of form our ecohydrology family, which we have currently around four uh, UNESCO category two center focusing on ecohydrology which is European Center on Ecohydrology, African Center on Ecohydrology, Asia Pacific Center on Ecohydrology, and another one in uh, Brazil and Paraguay. And then uh, we also have our around six uh, uh, UNESCO chair, which based in the universities in various countries, which fo focus on uh, ecohydrology. So this is how we work together with this um, water family or ecohydrology family to help us to implement various approach in uh, ecohydrology. So uh, by definition, uh, ecohydrology is the holistic approach of the analysis, uh, understanding of processes and regulation, which is dual regulation of water and biota um, uh, interplay. So, so uh, we use this uh, um, dual regulation between biota and hydrology. Uh, which is also scientific uh, uh, um, field in, inside the sciences of ecology and hydrology, and specifically studies about interaction between water bodies and different uh, ecosystem. So it is a transdisciplinary and uh, applied science, uh, uh, also subdiscipline of hydrology that seeks to understand the ecological process controlled by the hydrological cycle. So uh, we use the common uh, definition by uh, defined by Professor Zalowski, which is also our um, uh, chair of the scientific uh, advisory committee of ecohydrology in uh, UNESCO. And as uh, the concept is, um, uh, I mean, the, the, there is of evolution of the hydro ecohydrology itself. So the concept also uh, um, I mean, uh, the concept also evolved from. Uh, only by uh, dual regulation of biota and um, hydrology, 
but now we want to focus on the uh, achievement uh, to achieve the improvement on the the, the four element which is WBSR to improve uh, water uh, W is water to improve water quality and water quantity also to enhance biodiversity B um, in the catchment area and then uh, to improve also the ecosystem services in the catchment. And last but not least, to improve the resilience to climate and impact. So this is our main objective uh, uh, for implementing this uh, ecohydrology approach. And it can be done through uh, CME, which is culture and education, as UNESCO work on the not only scientific approach, uh, approach um, aspect, but also on the culture and education uh, uh, aspect. So this is how important uh, the importance of social elements to improve, Im, implement ecohydrology for improving uh, the scientific uh, related issues. And nowadays also we add another element which is low policy and govern, governance to make sure the sustainability of uh, the uh, initiative that uh, we have conducted in or implemented in the catchment. So we, we develop ecohydrology as a transdisciplinary scientific approach to achieve water quality improvement and also biodiversity enhancement and sustainable development by using this understanding of relationship uh, between uh, hydrological and biological uh, process. And uh, so it is um, also integrative transdisciplinary science which providing nature-based solution not only for reduction of impact, but also enhancement of the catchment sustainability potential. And why uh, ecohydrology is important? Uh, because it is um, uh, it is aimed to find a solution oriented uh, method by reducing anthropogenic impact and restoring aquatic uh, ecosystem. So by implementing ecohydrology, we will achieve the environmental integrated solution. Um, which is uh, through restoring and maintaining the long term um, uh, ecosystem, and then natural adaptable uh, uh, natural adaptable solution because all of which uh, implemented are, uh, are uh, natural uh, through increasing or improving the carrying capacity uh, of the ecosystem. Also, it will be long term sustainable solution because it will create sustainable solution for water management and also eco-friendly and low-cost solution because it is not as expensive as other uh, method or concrete things or uh, other things. So, uh, and it will improve society connection with water bodies when we have beautiful or good uh, nature uh, or, or our uh, ecosystem. Oops. Um, okay. Where is it right now? Um, uh, this is just to highlight uh, to you, uh, there is a recent publication by Nature on ecohydrology, which referring to our UNESCO ISP ecohydrology work, which already more than 20 years uh, work, which um, focus on the governance aspect, uh, which is a radical reshaping of the water governance. Uh, that is an uh, important element of ecohydrology also. And related to ecohydrology, um, which uh, use or mimic this process to uh, play a key role in enriching biodiversity, and also not uh, not uh, forgetting the the society element because we need to bring uh, the necessity of involving the decision making processes. So this uh, three element is um, a di uh, diagnosis of key messages uh, by nature. Uh, as an output of UN Water Conference recently we conducted uh, on ecohydrology. And it's also sort of an acknowledgement of the ecohydrological work that UNESCO have been doing. And uh, in terms of the approach uh, of uh, ecohydrology, UNESCO currently focus on this uh, or categories uh, for uh, approach or element of ecohydrology, which can be done through environmental flow or hydrological flow, which is common uh, uh, approach done by um, many peoples, and also through uh, or use by using phytotechnology, using uh, plants or vegetation to uh, implement ecohydrology. Also use uh, through fauna technology by using specific spaces to uh, absorb uh, pollution or to in, to reduce the impact, and also through uh, ecohydrological infrastructure. So this is the the current for ecohydrology methodology that we use in uh, our demonstration site. 
and the implementation at, uh, itself uh, at the catchment scale can be at, at the basin or city or urban area, also in inland wetlands and in the rivers and lakes. And last but not least, also in estuaries or coastal water, which is uh, the aspect that uh, I will share uh, with all of you today. And uh, we need to also bring uh, people in, in the implementation of ecology. So the uh, stakeho stakeholder is important to be part of uh, this uh, ecology implementation, including local stakeholders and community, uh, state and national agencies, uh, various researchers, various partners and donors uh, and other supporters, uh, which, uh, which uh, need to, to bring them, all of them in board, uh, on board to make sure the implementation of ecology will be uh, sustainable. This is uh, one of the example of implementation of ecohydrology uh, in Malaysia, for example, where Putrajaya Lake and Wetland is one of the ecohydrology demonstration site uh, since 2010. So we use uh, wetlands for improving water quality. Uh, so it's achieved the W element here. And then uh, at the same time, when we have good water quality and good water quantity, the bio biodiversity in the uh, wetland is also improved. Um, so we achieved the, another objective, uh, which is for biodiversity enhancement. And when we get this uh, beautiful water, uh, good uh, biodiversity, uh, we also improve the ecosystem services in this um, area. So there's uh, another uh, objective. And, and when this um, or, um, implementation is already creating a good uh, environment of, uh, of the lake and wetlands area, uh, so it also becoming resilient to climate and impact. This is another objective or main implementation of ecology that we want to achieve. And the implementation also mixed uh, through the culture and education uh, where in Putrajaya, Malaysia, we also have, uh, have been conducted before this many or series of community participation and awareness program. And also it's, it is supported uh, by law, policy and governance in Putrajaya by having a local agenda 21, uh, or also another document towards of low carbon green city, which um, make sure or en make, uh, ensuring the in um, the maintenance or the conservation of ecosystem towards achieving this specific uh, law policy and governance uh, in Putrajaya. So uh, it will in, uh, improve the WBSR, CE, and LPG, which is our main uh, component elements uh, for ecology. Uh, for sustainable water management in Putrajaya. And uh, how we work, uh, as I mentioned, uh, we also pro uh, promote this ecology since 2010 through specific approach. Um, um, sorry, we promote, uh, we, we work on ecology since uh, 1996, but we start the implementation of ecology demonstration, the establishment of ecology demonstration set, uh, since 2010 by applying ecological uh, solution in various catchment. So since last year, we make an uh, annual call. We start to make an annual call to um, for new ecology demonstration site because we want to promote this ecology approach more and to make sure many others uh, catchment area will be uh, join our network uh, to have um, more impact to the community and also to the uh, global, global impact uh, to all countries. So currently, UNESCO have 37 demonstration sites in 26 countries, as you, you can see here. Uh, five in Africa, uh, 11 in Asia, uh, 12 in Europe, and around nine in Latin America and Caribbean. And if you can see the different color here, uh, green shown the uh, implementation of ecohydrology at the basin or the city, and blue uh, shown the implementation at the river and lakes uh, areas. And the yellow is implementation of ecohydrology at the wet uh, inland wetlands. And red color is implementation of ecohydrology at the estuaries and coastal water. So this is what I want to share today, which uh, currently UNESCO have four um, coastal uh, estuaries or coastal uh, ecohydrology, which is, uh, you can see here, these four uh, red color, I also list down here. So uh, Victoria Lake in and wetlands, um, sorry, Victoria Ponds wetland in Bahamas, Castella Bay in Croatia, uh, Guadiana Estuary in Portugal, and also Omeli Gar El Meleh Lagoon in Tunisia. 
So um, just a quick share with all of you about Guadiana, uh, Guadiana Estuaries, Portugal. So um, there is a, a development uh, of the Guadia, of the um, what of the aquifer dam there in in this um, uh, Guadiana Estuary, and it gives the impact uh, of the uh, ecosystem like a uh, uh, reduction of the uh, uh, by uh, uh, various uh, uh, habitat or for example uh, fish in this uh, area and many others uh, environmental impact and they use the nature based solution approach to to deal with these issues such as by establishing the flat pulse uh, value um, uh, to control this uh, productivity um, of the planktonic diversity to reduce uh, harm uh, uh, algal bloom, so so the, uh, so this is among the approach, and also they use the uh, fauna technology approach by using the bivalve density to absorb the pollution in this uh, area. Also, uh, plant technology, uh, which is uh, by using uh, wetlands to re uh, restore wetland to sustain the nursery function in this uh, um, in this uh, area. And also uh, using the um, uh, environmental flow to establish volume and uh, timing for dam discharge to restore river film and and COVID nursery function. So this is among the approach uh, conducted in Guadiana Estuary in Portugal, which um, which is one of our ecohydrology demonstration site in uh, uh, Portugal. Another ecohydrology demonstration site in Castela Bay, uh, Costa. There is also many issues or related to environmental uh, um, in this uh, um, Castilla Bay. And they use uh, implement specific project called uh, integral, integral project of Castilla Bay uh, protection, uh, where they they conducted the ecological pro project in, in this uh, area. And it uh, improved the protection and preservation of water quality in this area. Also safe development of economy and maintenance of improvement uh, and achieve uh, level of environmental protection. That is another example. Also another example uh, for ecohydrological uh, approach in coastal area, uh, which is uh, in Victoria Ponds or wetlands uh, in Bahamas, where they have uh, a problem related to uh, mangrove um, um, reduction or degradation. Um, and they, they, they conduct a, large uh, program uh, which is a restore, restoration of Victoria Pond uh, called Ramsar Caribbean Wetlands Initiative um, by having a specific uh, ponds, uh, wetlands pond in the uh, nearby the, the coastal area. So the, the water um, um, uh, in this, um, in this um, um, coastal area will be filtered before entering uh, uh, the coastal area. So this is among another approach uh, implemented by uh, the, uh, another uh, demonstration site uh, related to coastal in Bahamas. And this is quite recently, uh, we have another demonstration site in Tunisia, which is Gar El Meleh uh, Lagoon. Um, it's it's focus, uh, their, their study focus on physical, chemical, and environmental evolution. Uh, so they these uh, colleagues uh, in Tunisia implement the an observatory of the coastal area by using specific um, um, wet, uh, not wetland, by specific uh, plant. I think they use uh, bamboo bamboo here. So the implementation of this Omari observatory to to reduce the impact that they have uh, related to the ecosystem in this um, um, coastal areas also by using natural approach. And it's already implemented, and it show a uh, good uh, impact for the ecosystem, uh, and also freshwater restoration in this uh, area. So this is uh, among few good uh, example for the ecohydrology demonstration site in um, uh, in coastal or estuaries uh, uh, areas in in our I mean four four countries. And um, as I mentioned earlier, UNESCO also promote the ecohydrology approach uh, within UNESCO designated site, which is UNESCO Biosphere Reserve, UNESCO World Heritage Site, and UNESCO Global Geopark. So we we are uh, continuing this uh, promoting because we want to impl uh, to uh, implement the good example of ecohydrology approach in these specific um, uh, areas. 
and also we do the uh, various uh, in them, uh, various promotion of the program um, such as through various capacity building uh, program like a workshop or trainings uh, for improved water management related to ecology so currently uh, since at least since uh, 2022 and, and 2023 we have been implemented around 26 ecology workshop around the world and we we focus on uh, we, not focus we we also promoting this uh, ecohydrology approach in around 11 UNESCO designated sites in these uh, countries and for around 45 member states involved uh, or get benefit uh, through this implementation and more than 100 uh, expert uh, participated or uh, involved in these uh, programs and as you know, also UNESCO work on the promoting ecology approach in all regions. So we we have uh, implemented in European and North America, and also in the Africa region, in the Latin America and Caribbean. Also, quite recently in Asia Pacific, which we have uh, our session in uh, China, which I, I just came back last week from China. And we also promote the ecohydrology for youth. So we encourage uh, youth participation for for um, I mean, to get involved with our program and to support our ecohydrology initiative uh, through joining our ecohydrology emerging professional global network or EPGM. And um, also another uh, program for youths, which we have um, the master program on Erasmus Mundus in applied ecohydrology, which currently uh, implementing in this four consortium of university in Portugal, in um, um, in Belgium, in Germany, and also in Poland. So these four universities are joined of effort uh, and supported by UNESCO ASP to implement a uh, Master of Erasmus Mundus started in 2021 until now, which um, we will have the, the launching of the third batch of this master program uh, next uh, two weeks uh, in early October. So for those interested, especially uh, youth or young people, you can also apply for this master on ecohydrology uh, in this university. And as, as we promote our ecohydrology initiative, we launched the call of ecohydrology demonstration site, as I mentioned also earlier. So the deadline for this year is just finished because if uh, the call start in from June until August. So for those who of you uh, who are interested can join for next year call. Uh, which will be open uh, in June. So welcome to join us. And I would like to encourage all of you also to establish the new ecology demonstration site or promote the nature-based solution of which in your specific uh, catchment areas. And if you're interested also can explore new UNESCO water related chairs and category two center on ecology and uh, to strengthen the youth ecology network because we want to bring more youth in uh, as part of our work. And welcome for further collaboration and partnership in all water-related activities. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rama Rafi uh, with an interesting uh, topic, uh, especially on the topic on the eco-hydrology. And uh, we have listened to our first speaker just now on the nature-based solutions, as well as the se second speaker on uh, eco-hydrology. We have a complete set of the uh, nature-based solutions, actually, uh, for the sustainable cost and assuring developments. So uh, we are now come to the, uh, the, the Q&A discussion sections. Uh, I would like to open to everyone. If you have any questions, please raise your question in the chat box. Uh, as well as if you have any question you want to voice out, you can raise your hand, then I can invite you for, to, to ask the questions. Uh, for this moment, maybe I will read out uh, a few questions here from our chat box here. And uh, we have also Professor uh, Arthur have answered quite many of the questions offline, uh, where I think all the participants, you can access to the Q&A uh, chat box, uh, where that will be, uh, tell you about the questions and also the answer. So I will read out one of the questions here from our one of the participants from Mohamed Zin. Uh, how do we foresee some of the nature-based solution long-term impact on the sustainability on carbon footprints? For example, seaweed farming uh, as a nature-based solution is good 
to contribute towards sustainability and reducing carbon Organizations for the short terms, but it is also reverse long term impacts. Is there any guideline about what to choose and what not in the nature based solutions? Maybe I would like to invite uh, our speakers, uh, any one of you, if you would like to answer these questions here. Well, I'm happy to, uh, yeah. happy to yes. address that, uh, Song Yen, if, if, if I may. Uh, it's obvious that. Uh, there's no universal answer like uh, we should do this and not that and the other thing. The, these are items to investigate and they require studies, depends on the local conditions. Uh, but in general, I think the importance of nature-based solutions uh, is to take the natural developments into account in your engineering design. Uh, it's not so that we can rely on uh, natural developments or nature-based approaches only but when we do a design whether it's a constructing coastal reservoir or dams or, or or whatever is needed for flood protection for example we may want to think of the natural development of coastline whether it's sustainable or whether the coastline will retreat uh, whether sandy beaches uh, can be used rather than concrete dams and these types of uh, components um, depend on the local conditions, maybe different in the Netherlands and uh, in Bangladesh, for example, just to name two deltas. Uh, but this is part of the research which is ongoing. The main message is uh, take into account the natural development and uh, na nature, uh, natural coastline development, for example, before you start interfering with it. That's great, uh, Professor Arthur Madet. And okay, we uh, have uh, any other questions from the uh, participants here? Yeah, we have one more question uh, from uh, Professor Roger Falconer. Okay, uh, he's asking about uh, to what extent can nature-based solution meet the high safety standards, especially against the uh, flooding as a disaster that are being used in the Netherlands? Maybe this question is direct to Professor Arthur Minutes. Sure, that's a very important question. The short answer is uh, it cannot just by itself. Uh, there's no way that, uh, um, say extreme events can be remedied by nature-based solutions only. So it's absolutely necessary to develop engineering ways, whether it's storm surge barriers or closure dams or whatever, because that's needed to provide the safety levels that are required in the Netherlands. So the way and the challenge is to develop that in such a way that it's um, under non-extreme conditions also securing the water quality issues and the uh, living conditions i would say um, ra uh, rather so it's a blend i would say the 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 challenge is to find an engineering blend between uh, safety and uh, the environment. That, that would be my answer there. Thank you very much, Arthur. And uh, I think uh, we also listened to our second speaker, both, uh, Dr. Rama F3 just now, regarding on one of the project site in Putrajaya. Maybe uh, we would like to invite uh, Rama F3, you can you explain a little, a little bit more uh, about this project and how this significantly uh, affect our especially on the eco-hydrology aspect uh, for the coastal and also assuring uh, developments. But uh, anyway, this is uh, just an uh, inland uh, lake. Uh, I am not sure. Uh, maybe uh, the contributions will be uh, uh, not so much compared to uh, any of the estuary uh, developments or coastal developments. Yeah, Dr. Yeah. Uh, okay. Thanks, um, but I will answer this and also maybe in line with the first question uh, just now, uh, which mentioning how to, to make sure the sustainability. 
This is actually why we introduced the eco-hydrology approach. It is not just a nature-based solution approach, but it, we call it as advanced nature-based solution because uh, in order to, to get this eco-hydrology implementation, we need to also um, uh, restore the, the water and also the advancement of the ecosystem in this uh, area. So, um, and, and by, by using eco-hydrology approach, we also blend it um, with, uh, that's why we call it also transdisciplinary approach, because we also uh, implement uh, or bring uh, social elements there, which is uh, people, to make sure the participation of various other uh, elements, uh, which is culture and education, and also uh, law policy and governance. Because by, by having these all elements in place, then we can make sure or ensuring this um, sustainability by only, uh, if if only implementing one elements of uh, nature based solution, we cannot sustain this um, uh, initiative. So there is many other aspect that we need to take into consideration to make sure the sustainability. So it is similarly like the case in Putrajaya that I mentioned uh, and with I share with all of you. This all element is um, took in uh, uh, into account. Uh, this uh, element of the yeah in, uh, improving this there is they also use wetland for the um, um, for improving the water quality in this uh, in the lake and it even though it is not really coastal uh, it is not coastal ecosystem but they in inside Putrajaya they have also similar approach uh, by having the wetland vegetation and when there is a flood for example. There is all, they also receiving the impact uh, of flood, uh, which affected the um, ecosystem services there. But it's shown that um, by implementing this, uh, by using this um, specific uh, wetlands to, uh, this wetland can also function in not only to absorb uh, water uh, pollution, uh, water pol not only to absorb pollutant, but also function as a mitigation of the flood in this um, uh, area, in this wetland area. So uh, similar approach by, if we use this wetlands uh, in others uh, coastal area, it can be functioning similarly, but of course we need to study others environmental condition and uh, to get this uh, uh, good benefit and yeah, to, to study also the quantification of this uh, specific um, uh, ecosystem that uh, we need. Yeah, uh, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Alfie Tree. I totally agree with you. Uh, to manage a water system, ecosystem, we should manage from the top of the hill until the sea. Where today's topic, we are not only focusing on the sustainable of the uh, coastal and estuary developments, but we are also looking at the natural-based solutions and uh, as well as the eco-hydrology aspect, where that will be the best. Uh, we can look out from the upstream of the rivers, until the sea, which is a downstream. And uh, we have uh, one more question from uh, our participant here. Oh, you see uh, Professor Arthur have answered the question offline. But anyway, we have a few questions uh, in the list now. Uh, yeah, one of the questions is, uh, is uh, are nature-based solutions also applicable in the urban environments? Maybe uh, and either of you can answer these questions. I'm ready to take that up, uh, Song Yen. Uh, yep. Strictly speaking, of course, uh, nature-based solutions in an urban environment, man-made environment, uh, is a bit of a contradiction. Then again, uh, as with coastal protection or estuarine development, um, it's possible to have a pleasant living conditions or secure that in urban environment, yet having the safety measures in place. Let me just mention some um, possibilities that are being used in the Netherlands or Hong Kong or others. And that is making use of temporary storage, for example, parking garage or sub parking garage reservoirs underground that you don't notice but that can store uh, excessive pluvial uh, uh, 
say, disasters uh, before being released onto the river or, or out to the sea or back uh, for reuse again. In Rotterdam, for example, there are some parts uh, that are, look like parks. They're very pleasant. People can play during summer days. But to, in essence, in case of extreme uh, events, it can serve as a temporary storage. And there's no harm or not much harm in flooding uh, parks on a Sunday afternoon if there's no people around than uh, to having uh, parts of the city inundated. So, so you can blend again, you can blend these sol solutions with a, a natural environment and that's the challenge and that's being researched uh, in many parts of the world. Yeah, yes. Definitely, I think uh, Professor Arthur, uh, I agree with you, and this is a good answer. Elfie, Elfie do you want to answer? Yes, uh, I can also answer uh, add, as add on additional input of uh, this uh, question from for this question. As you seen also in my presentation, there is a map of the ecology demonstration site. In fact, we have one of the category of the catchment implementation in the city or um, uh, basin basin catchment and some of them are also urban urban areas and of course this when when we implement ecohydrology in the urban uh, urban catchment it become the big scale of implementation it's, it's not the small scale or pilot project and we have few of this um, um, urban uh, demonstration site such as in in France itself urban periphery of Lyon and there is uh, there is uh, some um, uh, but and but the way we implement ecology because ecology implementation is always um, liaises with the aquatic ecosystem. So it means when it is urban area, we will need to improve the aquatic uh, ecosystem in this urban area, and it will affect to the uh, uh, all the uh, uh, water water quality in, within the urban uh, catchment, and also the uh, by by having this. Um, improvement of this water in this urban area, which also improve the ecosystem services, climate resilient in this urban area. In fact, that is one of our aim for the implementation of ecology. But of course, some countries uh, or some areas, they cannot work on the urban because they have only very small catchment uh, area or pilot, uh, pilot site or demonstration site. But selected demonstration site we have uh, in the urban areas also. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Dr. Rama. Uh, yes, I, uh, uh, this is one of the good question, good answer questions, and also uh, we have listened to uh, both the spe speaker on the answer and uh, the nature-based solutions uh, as well as uh, eco hydrologies uh, very uh, very important uh, part uh, to make sure that we can uh, achieve uh, in terms of the uh, sustainable uh, water management uh, in terms for water quantity the quality as well and also uh, to take care of the biodiversity as also highlighted by Dr. F3 just now in your uh, your lectures. And uh, we have uh, one uh, participant here just raise a hand. Uh, maybe uh, the secretary can you invite uh, him. Uh, we have engineer Lim Simpo. Uh, he's, he's from the Global Water Consultant. He would like to ask the questions here. Uh, Gina Lim, uh, the, floor, the floor is yours. Can you unmute, then uh, you can speak. Yeah, I, I, I just uh, get to know from our uh, secretariat, the, the participants are not allowed to speak. Uh, anyway, I will read out the message or the questions from uh, Engineer Lin Simpo from Global Water Consultant, Malaysia. And uh, his question direct to uh, Dr. F. V. Three. Can you please uh, brief briefing uh, brief us about the main criteria to be an eco hydrological demo site? Uh, in your opinion, is Shanghai Ching Sha is one of the good demo site for this? Yeah. Uh, do you get the questions, uh, Dr. F. V. Yes. Yes. Okay. Yeah. yeah. Okay. Actually, we I would like to invite all of you also to. Uh, to go or to check in our ecohydrology web platform, which we have list down there the minimum criteria to become a demonstration site. 
and of course one of the eco, uh, the criteria is have to be implement the ecohydrology principle and technologies because some demonstration site they don't do anything yet and they apply for demonstration site then we cannot accept because the main uh, important uh, elements they need to show or to implement the ecohydrology uh, ecohydrology principle and technologies in this uh, in their catchment then when they show the specific impact or result of the implementation then only they can uh, apply for a demonstration site. And then, of course, it's mostly project solution uh, oriented. It means uh, to solve the specific issues, like either to address water quality issues or to, uh, to address uh, sedimentation or all, all aspects of uh, uh, water and environmental issues. They need to highlight the issues and then what are the, sol the solution, the nature-based solution of which uh, solution to implement the issues. And also because we our approach is not only the scientific aspect, but also the culture, education, and law policy. So they need to show the multi-stakeholder involvement in this in their, their implementation, need to show the local community participation, uh, and also most impor important, also the sufficient funding. Because if they don't have fund, it is difficult to sustain or to make sure the implementation will, will be sustainable. So this um, sum of elements need to, to have uh, already in place. So it means they need to strategize on how to get this all elements, then only they can, uh, yeah. But, but it means whatever it is, they need to show uh, the implementation first, not, not planning to do. If it is planning to do, it means not yet, um, uh, not yet uh, uh, what suitable, uh, sorry, not, not yet, um, uh, what uh, cannot cannot apply for equitable demonstration site yet, so they need to show showcase the the implementation first. And but okay. it is open for all to apply, not only the government but all all the universities, NGOs, uh, individual or researchers or uh, expert on equitability. It's welcome to apply uh, demonstration uh, demonstration site. Yeah, thank you very much, uh, Dr. Rama. I think uh, I would suggest the uh, participants uh, to look into the UNESCO website to find out the criteria to become the UNESCO demonstration slide, site. And also uh, due to the, I think the time, uh, we have can only answer one more question. But before that, uh, maybe uh, we have uh, two questions here. Uh, is there any questions? I think the speaker you want to answer live or one of these questions you can actually answer live. Yeah, but I can see uh, Professor Arthur is uh, writing on the answer for Shahira, which is one of the participants. Maybe uh, Dr. FE3, you want to answer the first question. Uh, what is the uh, eco-hydrology usually faces uh, some challenges in creating the long-term effect on the eco ecological and hydrological changes in the rapidly changed climates? Leading to the uncertainty in the applications. How can we overcome all these issues? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yes, because um, uh, that uh, there is also in my presentation because it is a nature-based solution. It's it will achieve the long term. Uh, so um, um, the long term. Um, uh, so so uh, I mean good, good uh, environmental condition for the long term. Uh, long time. Because it is the um, um, what call it? It is it is low cost also because as compared to other uh, technologies, but because because it is um, a nat nature uh, adaptable solution, uh, so it will be um, uh, long term evolutionary because um, um, how to say because it is uh, it is a it is a natural so uh, so it will be adaptable with the environmental condition. So it will create the the long term um, ev uh, ecosystem, uh, good ecosystem. Uh, um, yeah, as compared to others, uh, others um, uh, technologies or infrastructure that will can that can be broken in one or two years, maybe like I mean, depends on the maintenance also. But when we use the nature uh, based solution, it will also long term sustainable solution. Um, yeah, because uh, because we use ecosystem properties uh, for the management, so then the ecosystem will be sustained there. Okay, that's great. Uh, thank you very much, Dr. Rama, every three. 
I think I will keep uh, all your questions here. Uh, we are not going to answer other questions because we, are, we have limited time here. And also we have uh, Professor Siva Kumar, uh, which uh, is chair of the, our specialty group of the Sustainable Coastal and Estuarine Development. We were going to close our section for today. But before that, I would just like to uh, invite all of you to come to our conference, our international conference on IACR in this November uh, in China, where you will be learn more about what is uh, eco hydrology as well as on the nature based solution for the sustainable coastal and estuary developments. And uh, we're going to have our field trip uh, to the Qing Chao Sa, which has been mentioned by one of our participants just now. It's one of the good examples of the demonstration site. Uh, maybe UNESCO can consider that as part of that. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, I will pass back to uh, Professor Sima Kumar. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Fang Yen, and thank you. Uh, um, uh, right at the start, we did ask some poll questions. Uh, uh, so I would like to share that poll results with you, actually. Uh, I hope you all can see this. Uh, so we did ask, uh, at the time it was about 88 participants, 66 out of the 88 has participated. So there's a quite a good uh, response, 75%, mostly coming from Asian continent, uh, and I can understand that North American uh, American continents are sleeping at the time, did, obviously would not have suited them. And most of you have come from uh, academia and industry, uh, and there's a bit of mix. I can see that governments, uh, NGOs, etc. So that's good to see that sort of mix. Perhaps uh, we may have to have more government and planning authorities to participate in future. Um, in terms of uh, experience, it's good to see that quite a number of you, over 50%, actually have at least uh, five or six experience uh, years or more experience in this area, which is very nice. Uh, but we did ask whether are you familiar with those three focal areas in, in our specialist group, coastal reservoirs, tidal basins, and um, uh, waterfront developments. Uh, I think it looks to me that it's order of 10 to 15% of the people are familiar with this. Uh, uh, and others are very much interested. So I think that's something uh, that we will take that on board in our future seminars and future development. So, so I'll stop at that point with that sharing. Um, okay, so I can... I'm unable to advance the slides, okay. So we'll, I'd like to uh, uh, quickly run down some of the upcoming uh, IWA uh, events, uh, webinars and events. And the first one is this uh, uh, very unique, I would say, for IWA. It says first IWA non-sewered sanitation conference. And as you all know, many cities and country towns and et cetera, there are many non-sewered areas. So this would be very interesting. Uh, this is going to happen on the 15th of October. It's a, I'm assuming this is a webinar. Uh, the next one is, uh, Fang Yen has mentioned that uh, I have also put this slide at the start. Uh, it's, it's our conference. It's going to take place between 6th to the 9th of November uh, in Changshao City uh, at uh, near uh, Hoha University's new campus. Uh, and I hope uh, some of you will be able to join us uh, for this uh, very important event. And the next one is uh, is uh, further down in November. Uh, there's an uh, IWA Digital Water Summit uh, summit uh, in uh, Bilbao in Spain. Uh, so I, I think this is another uh, an, very important uh, event for uh, IWA as we go through whole range of digital. Uh, we, we live in digital uh, environment, I guess. So so the, so water uh, digital water summit would be an exciting one to attend. Uh, and then finally, I would like to uh, also talk about the Water and uh, Development Congress and Exhibition. It's uh, in uh, Kigali in Rwanda, and that, that's uh, in uh, between 10 to the 14th of uh, uh, December 23. So we have nearly come to the end of our uh, webinar. I, I want to thank again our world-renowned two speakers, uh, Prof. Adam Inet and uh, Dr. Rama lp 3 I'd like to thank uh, our moderator, Professor Fang Yen uh, Tio, um, and uh, also the IWA team who has been particularly with Erin uh, Jordan and others who have really took some time to make sure that these uh, type of events are running very smoothly. 
And uh, lastly, certainly not the least, that all the audience who have just stayed uh, till the end of the session. So thank you very much. And we hope to see you all soon in a next webinar or in a conference. And I will uh, say in, oh yeah, so there is some more. Uh, okay, so this is uh, uh, joining a network. Uh, so for example, you can become a, a member of uh, our network. Uh, by using this code and there's a special discount which is applicable to till 31st of December. Um, and finally, thank you very much uh, uh, for all uh, participants uh, and uh, attendees. Thank you.